Okay, I started working on this presentation when it became obvious that Mitt Romney was going to be the nominee of the Republican Party. I wanted to know more about Mitt Romney. So here's the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about Mitt's roots, young Mitt, rich Mitt, governor Mitt, candidate Mitt, the God forbid, president Mitt, and then the real problem. And the real problem is a surprise ending that I'm not going to tell you until we get there. So let's talk about Mitt's roots. His father's George Romney. Now, I'm from Michigan. Uh, Romney was, that's where he made his name in Michigan. He was president of American Motors in the 50s. He was our governor in the 60s. He ran for president in 68. And he ended up being Nixon's uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. He was a moderate Republican. When he was running American Motors, if he thought the company didn't do well enough and he was therefore overpaid because he was the leader, he wrote out a check and sent it back to the company. He was very good friends with Walter Ruther, who was the founder of the uh, UAW, and they together put one of the first profit sharing plans for the employees of American Motors. He was also one of the first CEOs to support the Michigan Fair Labor Act. He was a good guy. Here's my favorite quote from George. Any politician who will not show multiple year tax returns is like <laughs> He's a couple years younger than I am. He was brought up in Bloomfield Hills. Bloomfield Hills is the part of the Detroit area that is new money. The old money is in Gross Point Farms and Gross Point. He attended Cranbrook Prep School, which is where the rich people send their kids, still do. He attended Stanford for one year. And then he received the draft deferment to go on a mission uh, on the Mormon required missionary work. Now this is a picture of Mitt in France. He was there for two and a half years. Um, he speaks French. He has an affinity for the French, although he'll never tell you now. <laughs> the one thing that I found interesting here is when Mitt left France, there were 175 Mormon missionaries in France, and Mitt was responsible for all of them. This is a smart guy. This is a natural born executive. After he came back from France, he went to Brigham Young University and graduated in 1971. His degree was in, I want to get it right, Bachelor of Arts in English. When he graduated, he gave the commencement address for both the College of Humanities and the entire Brigham Young University. Another case where Mitt Romney ends up being the leader. After BYU, his father suggested that he get a degree in law. He was one of 15 people that entered the program at Harvard for a Juris Doctorate, which is the law degree, and a Master's of Business Administration. He graduated with honors. 1975, he's picked up by the Boston Consulting Group. I know people from the Boston Consulting Group. This is one of the premier consulting groups in the country. To get a job with them right out of college says something about you. Then he was hired by Bain and Company in 1976. And in 1978, he's a vice president for Bain and Company. He's still a kid. And he's vice president for the Prestige Consulting Company. Don't ever underestimate Mitt Romney. And then uh, Bill Bain asked him if he would leave Bain and Company and start up Bain Capital. The proviso there was you couldn't go to any Bain Company's existing clients to get your seed money to start the venture, cap venture capital <coughs> company. Well, see, venture capitalists don't invest their money. They invest other people's money. This is an ad I pulled. 
The Romney campaign does not dispute the fact that he founded Bain Capital with money from El Salvadorian families tied to the no notorious death squads that murdered at least 35,000 innocent people during El Salvador's Civil War. That was news to me when I started researching this. He got 40% of his startup money from a small handful of El Salvadorian families that had fled the country and moved to Miami. He went down there in 83. Um, they say that they checked them to see if there was any drug money, but it wasn't drug money. I think it was something worse. Now, the reason I put that cross over there with those four pictures, this has particular relevance to me because this is this is a a picture of the four church social workers who were abduct, abducted, raped, and murdered. And we're all in the same demographic, and you may or may not remember that. This is what started me questioning the United States' role down in overthrowing the uh, popular elected governments south of our border. In fact, this was when I started becoming a Democrat, really. Next slide. So he starts bank capital, he gets the money. From 84 to 94, 50 to 80 percent gains. Phenomenal, one of the best track records you can find. Venture capital companies make money in two different ways. One of the ways they make it is by investing in startup companies that banks won't touch because the risk is too high. You win some, you lose some, but when you win, you win big. Now Staples, he throws that out a lot. Staples, they got bank capital, seven dollars back for every dollar invested. There was Calumet Coach, that was a good one, thirty-four dollars back for every dollar invested. Gartner Group, sixteen dollars back. Now there is nothing wrong in my mind with doing that model because some people with bright ideas can't get a bank to back it and venture capital might. There's another way they make money. It's called leverage buyouts. <laughs> leverage buyouts are a little bit different. There was an episode where Tony Soprano became part owner of a restaurant. Inventory and booze came in the front door, bought on credit, went right out the back door where they sold it for 50 cents on the dollar. When they couldn't find anybody else to loan them money for more booze and food, they burned the restaurant down and collected the insurance money. Now, if you're a monster, it's a crime. But if you're vain capital, it's called a pump and dump. <coughs> pump and dump. I'll tell you how it works. Okay, here's the way the leverage buyout works. You always get other people's money first. You never invest your own. Then you buy a company. You buy a company, you think that you can go in and pump up the profits. You start cutting expenses. That usually means laying off people and cutting benefits. That inflates the profits. Then you go out and you borrow as much as you can. You declare a special dividend and you pay off your investors. And now you've got the company free and clear without any money into it. Then you sell the company. You keep the gains yourself. You only pay 15% in taxes. And now you've got a company loaded with debt that has to go bankrupt. And this doesn't happen every time, but it happens often. So let me give you a real example. Dave Barry. They took it over in 94. Immediately when they took it over, they cut the research budget in half and they started closing branches. What is it? Uh, they were in the medical um, 
the medical business. They, uh, they sold medical supplies. They started closing the branch offices. They converted the pension that saved $40 million. They cut benefit payments to employees. And then they borrowed $421 million and they did a special dividend of $385 million to the investors and themselves. And they only had $85 million in the business. So they did a $385 million payback for the $85 million they had. Then they took $100 million in management fees and they ended up going bankrupt in 2002. You pump up the debt and you, then you dump the company. Michael Rumbin, he is the Vice President of Technology at Day. Here's what he said. They leveraged this thing to the hill and got out what they could. We were left holding the bag. These guys worked for two years and ended up millionaires. That's exactly what happened. Where was that? The message of Mitt Romney's leadership at Bain is he's very good at making money. I will not take that away from him. If I, had, if I was the CEO of a company, I might hire him as president. He's going to make me money. But that's not a qualification for being the president of the United States. Right. 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 Then Mitt left and went back to Utah and took over the 2002 Olympics, which was $379 million in the red and had a huge scandal. The advertisers were leaving in droves, and they had a real problem. And Mitt Romney did a pretty good job there. He reorganized, he cut expenses, he went to the government, got them to throw in $600 million. <laughs> he's, he's no dummy. Uh, he managed a budget of $1.3 billion, had 700 employees and 26,000 volunteers. He did a pretty good job there. After that, he goes to run for the governor of the state of Massachusetts. This is what he ran on, and I picked this up from the articles. It's the very same thing he's running on right now. I had experience in the private sector. I know how to create jobs. I'll bring more good jobs to Massachusetts, insert the United States, like the lower in Texas, so on and so forth. The way to balance the budget is by cutting waste and inefficiency. Well, how do you do? Not good. <laughs> when he left in 2006, Massachusetts was 47th in job growth. They're, you know, 1.2 versus 4.8. They lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs. Mitt Romney ranked highest in state debt per person. When he took office, the pop, his approval rating was 61%. When he left office, it was 34%. The reason he was a one-term governor is he knew he couldn't win a second term. The people of Massachusetts rejected him. Now let's see what he did there. Remember, he's a venture capitalist. He knows the business model. He came to Massachusetts with a budget that wasn't balanced. How did he balance that budget? Well. He cut programs that affected the poorest and weakest people in Massachusetts. Now there's, there's a trend here. Uh, you cut suicide prevention programs, you cut osteoporosis screening programs, it's a, it's a model. And what it tells me is Mitt Romney lacks empathy. That's why. Empathy is the capacity to recognize feelings that are being experienced by others and feel compassion. And when I was doing the research, let's go back to Cranbrook and a couple incidents there, three incidents there. They had a, there was a student that had bleached his hair blonde, combed it over one eye that was thought to be gay. So Mitt and his friends decided that wasn't cool. They tracked him down. They, at school, in a classroom, in front of other students, they held him down and cut his hair. Now think about that. That is something to humiliate someone that is weaker than you are. Then there was another person that was presumed to be gay, and every time he'd 
say anything in class, Mitt would say, add a girl, add a girl. <laughs> Designed to humiliate. There was a teacher there that was legally blind. And Mitt's classmates told the story. There were two glass doors. Mitt got in front and opened up the first glass door so the teacher could walk through, got ahead of him again, and pretended to open up the second door and didn't. So the guy, you know, runs into the glass door. Now he did that to a teacher in front of his classmates. Not good at Stanford, and I could never find out if this had anything to do with the, the reason he left after one year, but they trapped a bunch of kids from the University of California to shave their heads and paint it red. Okay. You've all heard the story about the dog in the cage on the top of the car, and I have too, but what I didn't realize was it was a 1,200 mile trip. I thought it was, you know, two or three hours. No! And you can't, you can't breathe at 70 miles an hour very well. What I'm saying is men could, if some of these things we call being a bully. And he says he likes being able to fire people. I didn't say that, he said that. I don't know about you, but firing somebody, you know, I spent my career in business, firing somebody is about the worst thing in the world to do, but it seems to like it. And I'm not concerned about the very poor. Now, to be fair to Mitt Romney, he said, we have a safety net there. If it needs repair, I'll fix it. But he supports the Ryan budget and the Ryan budget cuts. The safety net that is there will be cut in half by Mitt Romney. Because you can't say, there's a safety net for the poor people and then turn around and say, I'm going to cut food stamps, I'm going to cut this, I'm going to, all the things that are the safety net. So, what would Nick do if he was king? And this is a fair question because I ask it to myself all the time. What would I do if I was king? How would I fix this country if I had it in my power to just go ahead and do it? Well, let's see. What does Mitt Romney do with his first official act? Because picking your vice president is not party, it's personal. Who does he pick? He picks Ryan. Paul Ryan, who is the chairman of the House Budget Committee. And here's what he said. And this slide, I want you to remember this slide. Because I'm very supportive of the Ryan budget plan. This budget deals with entitlement reform tax policies policy, which as you know is very similar to the one that I put out, I applaud it. It's an excellent piece of work and very much needed. He also has said that if the Ryan budget came across his desk, he would sign it. Remember that. The Ryan budget, he would sign if he was president. Now, then I went and I said, well, these are the four pillars of conservatism. This is the solution to every problem from the Republicans that we've faced in 50 years. And Obama did a pretty good job with that. You know, if you've got a cold, cut taxes. If you've got any problem, cut taxes. That's the solution. So let's see what he says. This slide is a little difficult to understand, so let me help. Up here, these are the low income, this is the high income, and this is percentage change in after-tax income. Now what this says, if you're making under $30,000 a year, under the Romney-Ryan budget plan, you are going to have less money after taxes with their plan. But if you make more than a million dollars a year, you're going to have 12 and a half percent more after-tax dollars because your taxes are going to be lower. And you might say, well, wait a second, the very poor don't pay taxes anyway. That's right, but they have deductions, deductions that will have to be eliminated. So the effect is, you take away from the poor and you give to the rich. I love this slide. And we told them the wealth would trickle down. <laughs> 
jokes on us, folks. Okay, next slide. Uh, regulations. Romney has said that his first act will be to direct all the agencies to start undoing the regulations put in under Obama. And the most important thing about this is this term, zero dollars. Because what he says he'll do is if any regulation costs business one dollar, it won't be put in place. Everything has to be zero dollars. So what Romney's really saying, that under a Romney administration, there will be no new regulations, period. Privatization. To be honest, he hasn't said much about privatization. But he has talked about, he made a comment about Wisconsin. And he said, did he, being Obama, not get the message of Wisconsin? The American people did. It's time for us to cut back on government and help the American people. Cut back on government. That means cut back on people in government. Cut back on the, the, the cost of firemen, policemen, teachers. That's not the real lesson of Wisconsin. The real lesson of Wisconsin is that the Koch brothers could throw $32 million into a race which is what Scott Walker had versus Barrett, who had $4 million and win. That's the lesson of Wisconsin. Entitlements. These are quotes from Mitt Romney on what he thinks about entitlements. Dependency is death to initiative, risk-taking and opportunity. Dependency is culture killing. It's a drug. We've got to fight it like the poison it is. That's what entitlements are. Social Security is an entitlement. I don't think it's poisonous. I like it. Uh, <laughs> raise the retirement age and lower the benefits. And this this thing about uh, privatization of Social Security, putting your money in the stock market, it had no way. The American people have rejected it. He's not talking about it, but Wall Street still wants the retirement accounts. It hasn't gone away. This was a slide fact-checking uh, Obama's claim that under the Ryan plan, people on Medicare would be paying $6,400 more, and it was found to be correct. Under the Ryan proposal, the cost would be $20,500. Under the current Medicare system, $14,750. And does anybody in here have an extra $6,400 to pay out every year? I don't think so. <coughs> This is the biggest, this is the biggest risk though. Medicaid. These cuts would start in 2013. 1.4 trillion out over 10 years. Now, 70% of the people in nursing homes depend on Medicaid. What are we going to do as Floridians if, if we have major cuts in Medicaid? Where do these people go? It's a serious Dying. deal. And, well, dying is one option. <laughs> Not a good one. Two-thirds of the proposed cuts in Ryan budget come from low-income programs. Medicare, Pell Grant, food stamps, low-income housing. Uh, it's, it's pretty sad, folks, what uh, this proposes to do to the weakest and poorest among us. So what we have in Mitt Romney is a wealthy businessman who was a one-term governor with a poor record, who's incapable of feeling our pain, and he wants the most important job on the planet, being the President of the United States. Now, we're now getting to the surprise ending. It just doesn't matter. How many people remember the movie Meatballs with Bill Murray? Where he gave what I consider to be one of the most best motivational speeches uh, in, in a movie ever. And let me set the stage for this a little bit. His summer camp is going into a competition with Camp Mohawk across the lake. Camp Mohawk has won the last 12 years. So Bill Murray is trying to tell the kids about this athletic event. 
And I'll give you part of the speech because it's really relevant here. Because we are in a meatballs moment. <laughs> if we play so far over our heads that our noses bleed for a week to ten days, if God Almighty in heaven comes down and points at our side of the field, if every man, woman, and child holds hands and prays for us to win, it just doesn't matter. Because all the really good looking girls are going to go out with the guy from Camp Mohawk because they've got all the money. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. What you think about Mitt Romney, what kind of a guy he is, just doesn't matter. The, oh, I want you now to disregard everything I've said about the individual, except that he would sign the right budget. Because it just doesn't matter who Mitt Romney is. He's a sock puppet. <laughs> and the people run to the sock puppet. David and Charles Koch drove to Northwest, who all the Republicans have signed a blood oath to, and Sheldon Adelson. If you vote for Mitt Romney, if he wins the presidency, these are the people that will be running the country. This is a cartoon, but it ain't funny. I pledge allegiance to Grover Norquist and the Tea Party for which he stands. There's no possibility for the last, uh, during the first Obama administration, that there was ever going to be agreement because they had all signed the oath. No taxes. No tax increases ever for any reason. And anybody that violated that would lose at the next election. And almost every Republican in the country, at the state, the Congress, and the Senate, took the pledge. Grover Norquist, I want to read you a quote from a speech he gave earlier this year. All we have to do is replace Obama. We are not auditioning for, fear, for a fearless leader. We need a president. We don't need a president to tell us what direction to go. We know what direction to go. We want the Ryan budget. That's why I said the Ryan budget when Mitt Romney said that he would sign it. That's why it's important. We just need a president to sign this stuff. We don't need someone to think it up or design it. Pick a Republican with enough working digits to handle a pin to become President of the United States. His job is to sign the legislation that has already been prepared. Now think about that. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> I can't find enough money to put that oh. in the yeah. 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 Next slide. Joe, next slide. These are the Koch brothers. These are the owners of America. Together they're worth $50 billion. Let me read you a quote from David Koch. And this was before the midterms. I'm very hopeful about the midterm elections, winning a big landslide here. Whatever happens, my brother and I are going to fight to our last breath to fight to preserve our free enterprise system to oppose socialism and to bring the country back to the basic values that we had when we were founded as a nation. Fight till their last breath. Charles Koch is 76. David Koch is 72. This may be their last chance. He also said, no centralized government, no matter how big, how smart, or how powerful, can effectively and efficiently control much of society in a beneficial way. On the contrary, big governments are inherently inefficient and harmful. The Koch brothers are libertarians. They believe the only legitimate role of government is to protect individual liberty. And that means to protect them and their money from us. They have a plan and they told us what it is. To start the federal government of revenue. They want a balanced budget amendment and a budget tied directly to gross domestic product that will eliminate all social spending. They don't even want 
public schools. You can believe that, and I am, I am not kidding. Go to the research, look at the 1980 <coughs> platform for the Libertarian Party when David Koch was running as the Vice President. Elimination of public education was one of them. They have been joined by 300 of the wealthiest business people in America promising $400 million in this election cycle to beat Obama. So you know what's coming in September and October? A landslide of lies to try to convince America to vote for their sock puppet. This is the best picture that I can I could find to explain, try to explain to you the America they want to take us back to. They want to take us back to a time before Medicare, Medicaid, before the 40-hour work week, before child labor laws, before women could vote, before Roe v. Wade. And I'll give you a hint, we ain't the ones in the buggy. <laughs> so that's kind of the surprise ending that it's not about Mitt Romney. <clears throat> it's about these guys and the guys who control the Republican Party. And here's my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. time to stop being a nation of sheep. It's time to get angry about what they are trying to do to our country and to the American dream for our kids and our grandkids. Because if we don't, folks, they ain't going to have one. Thank you very much.